on, everybody? What is happening? How's it hanging? You know who it is. This is Kevin from the Hard Progression Podcast, brought to you by my song today, Rock 2008. What's going on, everybody? How's it hanging? Happy Tuesday to you once again. It is October 8th, and, well, you just get straight up Kevin today. Yep, no guests, no nothing besides my voice, and it Shoot, I keep hitting that thing. Well, I'm just sitting here, you know, in my room with my uh, shirt on, pants, and my NASCAR hat. Yeah, because I usually wear a Kevin Harvick hat. You know, Kevin H. Kind of got something going there, so that's why I like the drive. But enough with that. We got another show for you today where we're going over a lot of new music. So the big thing we're going to go over today is the new album from Issues, their third release, Beautiful Oblivion. And then we'll go into songs from Alter Bridge. And I got kind of something I want to say about that. And a band that we featured before that is starting to get some real traction and make it big. So hopefully they'll be touring in 2020 as an opening act for some major rock band, but then we'll see. And I got a couple other fun things to talk about as well. I honestly keep hitting this, uh, this mic stand with my brim my hat, so I'm gonna turn that around. Alrighty, before we talk about all the new music and all the fun stuff, I gotta do sh- 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 shameless plugs. So again, guys, if I had uh, any kind of advertising, this is where it would be placed. But because I don't, I gotta just go straight off the cuff on this and do my own stuff. So pretty much the only shameless plugs we have is follow all our stuff, follow our Facebook page because you can get notified anytime anything really happens. Follow our Twitter account because Twitter, we're going to talk to you guys. Follow our Instagram page because we're going to talk to you. We're going to do Small Band Saturday stuff where we feature a smaller band and we're going to get them on and get kind of get them a little bit more uh, exposure to you guys so you can kind of find out some of the new music that's coming up and, you know, getting on these bands before they get started. So that's what we do for Instagram. We also do stuff like ask you questions. We do our Instagram live streams every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Central. It's an hour-long thing where you can talk with us. And our IGT videos, which is more behind-the-scenes vlog. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, because with YouTube, what you get there is, like, the album reviews we do, the full-on album reviews, and some other fun videos as well. You can also listen to the podcast there, along with Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play for the Core Progression Podcast. Am I missing anything? Yes, I am. I'm missing our Alexa skill. That's where you can hear every single song in its entirety, so... All of that stuff is in the description below, or not the description below, in the description of the podcast. Read follow. I keep saying it below because I'm used to YouTube. But we also have a TikTok uh, account as well that we're trying to get going, so follow that as well, at MSOTD. So, yeah. All right, enough of the shameless plugs because I know you guys don't want to hear me talk about shameless plugs all the time. But the fact that it's October and now it's starting to get cold outside... Well, not too cold. I'm liking the fall weather, though. I like the weather where it's like mid-50s, low-60s, maybe some uh, low-50s as well. I like a little bit of a chill in the air because, you know, you can, you can still wear shorts if you want. You can wear pants. You can do kind of anything you want. You don't have to turn on the heat, AC. I'm in a good spot right now when it comes to the weather. Mentally, I'm a little bit drained, though. But we're going to see what I can go off on here and just speak again, straight off the cuff, see what happens. And good thing I have the reverb turned all the way down. Otherwise, this would sound really really badly okay enough with that though let's get to it let's start talking about some of the new music that's come out and the big one for this week so far was beautiful oblivion the third album from the new metalcore band issues so i listened to it i was hoping to have the person or the uh, follower of our stuff that actually mentioned the album on but unfortunately, she was not feeling the best. I, uh, hopefully, by the time she hears this, that she is back to full strength. And we got to get her on sometime, too, because I was hoping to have her for the Motionless and White album review. That didn't happen. I was hoping to have her for the Sleepy With Sirens one. That didn't happen. Hope we have her for the Issues one. That didn't happen. The one thing I will make sure, though, is the next time Beartooth comes out with an album, she's going to be the one on here. No doubt about it. Biggest Beartooth fan I've ever seen in my entire life or heard of. So, enough with that. Let's go to Issues. So, for many of you who don't know who Issues is, Issues is a band that's been around, I believe, since about 2012, 2013, and they're new metalcore. So, you know how new metal back in the late 90s, they, like, corn, Slipknot, Disturbed, back in that kind of stuff, where they tried mixing hip-hop with, uh, with metal. Kind of like Limp Bizkit, too. Limp Bizkit might be, like, the epitome of it. Papa Roach did it as well, you know, with... Uh, Last Resort, Last Resort is a perfect example of a new metal song. Well, they're trying to go new metalcore. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to blend that metal, metalcore sound with top 40 songs. 
So instead of like going more hip hop, they're trying to blend it with pop. So some of their influences, they're all over the place. Their influences from the rock and ro uh, hard rock metal community follow places like Korn, Linkin Park, Slipknot. But then they go with some weird top 40 stuff like Katy Perry, Miley Cyrus, and, and even the Jackson 5. So where we got up to Issues and Beautiful Oblivion, their third release, their second release was called Headspace. And it peaked at number one on the Billboard Alternative chart. And I think Alternative is a good way to, if you're going to try and really put it together. It's a lot of stuff they're doing is Alternative. And it peaked at number 20 on the U.S. Top, Billboard Top 200. And now we're looking at where they were going. So they're doing an intense writing process. And on January 4th, 2018, they fired vocalist Michael Bond. So through that entire writing process, they noticed that a lot of the creative differences were really arising in how Michael wanted to go about it and how the rest of the Bammers wanted to go about it. And with Beautiful Oblivion, the rest of the Bammers wanted to go one way, Michael Bond wanted to go another way, so that Michael Bond essentially got the axe. But I think they still have a good relationship, so I hope that is the case. So when it comes to Beautiful Oblivion as a whole, they said it was going to be different, and it definitely was going to be different without Michael Bond there. And the overarching theme of the album, according to the band, was as the album is all about finding your inner peace despite the hardships life may place on you. So I was going through all the songs, like I listened to this album a couple of times, going through each and every song on the album to talk about issues, to talk about Beautiful Oblivion and everything about it. And after I listened to this album the first time through, my initial thoughts were, what is this? And what I mean by what is this, it's not like a what the hell was this? Like, you know, you're saying like, what is this? Like, I what the, what the heck is this? I don't like this. But what is it because I'm angry? No, my question literally was, what is this? And what I mean by what is this is I wasn't sure what the album was about. Like, I knew really looking and doing a deep dive into the lyrics, I could see the message behind every single song. And I will get to that later. But just on the sound alone... And trying to bring into a beautiful oblivion what the album truly did and have to have its own sound. I had no idea. It everything sounded so interesting and so different that I, the album didn't really have an identity. So I decided, okay, let's listen to it again. And one more time after that. And I came to the conclusion that Beautiful Oblivion as an album is really just a collection of songs. It is not a real album. But again, it is put together like an album, so it doesn't sound that way. That's what I'm trying to go for. It doesn't sound that way like it sounds like it's a real album. The reason behind that is because every single song is incredibly different. It's experimenting with many different aspects. They really took a lot of those, you know, metal sounds and influences, including their top 40 influences, and they mixed them all together, and they tried a lot of different things. So one thing I do want to say, though, is I do respect the fact that they have this willingness to experiment and try new things. And they're not going to get stale, which I do have to give them credit for. They, this album never got really stale because everything kind of surprised you every step of the way. However, man, I'm starting, I'm starting to get sick, but however, some just didn't seem right. It was like, it was like the, an overkill of it. So what I mean by overkill is... It sounded like the album just went way too far with experimenting to where, you know, too much of a good thing, or maybe potentially too much of just a certain thing, you know, kind of overindulging. Take Think, think about drinking. You know, you're drinking, you have like two, three beers, or I should say from like the Manic Talk Minute, two, three beers there. You have a couple of two, three beers, and you know, you're doing fine. You're not going to be puking, you're a little bit looser, you're a little bit more confident, you're feeling fine. But if you have 12 in two hours, or I think 13 in two hours, I think I actually pulled that off once, you're going to end up with your face in the toilet puking because you had too much of a good thing. And I think that's really what happened here. We had way too much experimentation for its own good. Now, I was going through the album and... I'm just going to talk about each song's meaning at this point. The reason being behind is because, like I said, the the band said that this album was all about finding your inner peace despite the hardships life may place on you. So let's take a look at how they find the inner peace within you taking and take a look at each song. So the first song is called Here's to You. When I listen to this song, it is a tribute to the people in our lives that kind of have stuck by us when we've been going through those mental hardships and kind of raising a glass and like, you know, here's to you, cheers to you kind of thing. And I like the way that started out because you're really giving a lot of credit to the people that are still with you, that really stuck by you in those hardships. So 
it got off to a good start in terms of the meaning. The second song, Drink About It, was all about a cheater being found, unfortunately, by their partner. Or by their unfortunate partner, I should say. Not unfortunately by their partner. Glad they got found out. And now, again, mental hardship. So now you're really starting to hone in on the mental hardships. Fine Forever is all about uh, feeling comfortable to be vulnerable with the person that you care about the most and let them in to know your insecurities and your deepest thoughts and everything about that so that you feel comfortable and then not shutting them out again, finding that inner peace and accepting love in your life. I get that. I totally get that because I am kind of one person that has problem confiding with people that I truly love. There's a lot of things I will say, but there are some things that I just really don't feel comfortable talking about. Even though I feel comfortable talking about almost anything, there's like a couple of things that really stick with me. And I, it, it, it does ruin some relationships if you're really trying to get close to somebody because then it's just like you're not letting them in and it's tough but i do understand where the song is coming from so i do like where it's coming off so far tapping out is all about trying to make something happen you're trying as hard as you can going 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 but then once you're done with it you just kind of feel like giving up or tapping out and again the mental hardship so you're really honing on that here with issues without you is all about you know Think about this. You're in high school, you're in college, you see a girl you like or a guy you like, whatever it may be, and you want to go and talk to him, you want to go and do you want to go and do something. Maybe you want to kiss, him. who knows? Maybe you're talking to him and you're and getting good but you're getting like a good vibe off of him and you know you just want to go for the kiss, but you're too afraid to make the move. You're not confident enough to make the move. This is what this song without you talks about. And we've all been there at one point. Maybe I should say most of us have been there at one point. So, it again, mental hardship. So they're really honing in on that. The song Rain deals with depression, how the mind reacts to it, where society's like, oh, you know, it's just, oh, you can get over it. Your friend's like, maybe just get over it. People you know, just get over it. But it's not that easy. So again, they're really honing in on it. But one thing I'm kind of getting concerned with is they're really dialing in on what the mental hardships are and talking about them instead of finding that inner peace. So we'll see how it keeps going. The seventh song, Downfall, is a song about kind of like going through a breakup in which you're blinded by love or lust that you let the other person essentially change who you are as a person. So again, going through the mental hardships of trying to get out of that situation. I recently have a friend who was in that kind of a situation and I had to basically be the one to kind of just coach him up and be like, you know, you got to do this for yourself, but it all depends upon if he want to do it for himself. Gladly, he is out of that relationship and he is doing much, much better. So downfall does have a little bit of a personal touch to me. The song's second best is a commentary about the lack of confidence that depression can have and makes people feel like they don't deserve the love or respect that they truly do. And I've seen this happen time and time again. So again, they're really honing in on the mental hardships. I'm like, where is this finding this inner peace? So the song Get It Right coming at number nine is... All about the initial lust you get when you're attracted to a person and you just kind of get lost in it all. That, you know, if you're a teenage boy, you're a teenage girl, and you find someone you like and you start dating them in like the first two months of the honeymoon phase, this is what it's talking about. But then you get past that point and you really get to have to, you know, fall in love with the person for who they truly are. So they really focus in on that. And I'm like, okay, okay, I see where you're going with that. But again, like I'm going to say it again, waiting for that inner peace to come. The song Flexin', this one was all about Tyler Carter's financial situation, about the band Lane Loose and having some fun, so it's all kind of just like a fun song, just kind of them trying to just let loose and have a good time. So, again, this is like the Black Sheep song of the album, and they did say that this song was the Black Sheep song, so I get it. No problem, keep it alive, come in at number 11. It's all about getting past the superficial part of the relationship at the beginning, and... Like, uh, what was the song of it? It was Get It Right. So it's kind of the it's kind of the second part to Get It Right. To where now that lust, that initial lust and the honeymoon phase is over, now you really got to focus in on that person and love them for who they are. So now you're really taking a look at more of the mental hurdles of this one. I'm like, okay, okay. But again, now we're getting to the end. Where is that kind of closure to find that inner peace? The song Your Sake is about those relationships we hold on to because we're afraid to let them go We're because we want to keep the memories even though we still have the memories if we let them go and we don't want to go out into the unknown this is like my buddy this is like me with one of my friends who i've known who i knew since 2009 and uh, essentially dropped her in 2018 all because of this and i'm glad i did my buddy's glad he did as well so again i'm understanding it but it's where's that inner peace this is kind of start kind of starting to take hold of that to where finding that inner peace and finally accepting and taking responsibility for your own happiness the last song is a titular song beautiful oblivion 
And it is a conclusion to how all those experiences make us and how they all drive us to find our inner peace and our beautiful oblivion. And I got to say how that worked out within each song and how the story was told. If you look at the lyrics, it's very easy to find that in there. But, oh, my God, did they do a good job on that. I have to really applaud them for that because the writing process it must have taken to really hone that in over the course of the past three years must have been tough. It could not have been easy. And I thought they hit it out of the park with that aspect. However, when you get to the songs, though, there are a lot of them that I kind of question because I'll just get into it. So we're going to start back up at the top with Here's to You. And the thing that I liked about the song was, again, it had this 80s kind of vibe where it had this 80s rom-com song kind of intro, but then it went into this more 80s R&B style verse and 80s hard rock chorus. So you're really focusing on the 1980s on this song specifically with the style, and I thought... This one's interesting because that R&B verse and that hard rock chorus, the kind of transition and the mixture of them, it works. But that 80s rom-com part of it, oh, no, 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 it does not work on me. And I was kind of thrown off by the song, wasn't the biggest fan of it, but I do respect the fact they're trying, again, change styles. And it's sticking within the 80s as well to kind of stick within three styles in there. Kind of thought it was a good move. Uh, let's talk about Drink About It, where it mixes this pop tendencies with a little bit of metalcore where... Outside of the chorus, it seemed incredibly overproduced with many electronic vibes, whereas this chorus was more consistent with an alt-rock sound and had cleaner vocals to it. Essentially, I thought of like, okay, take 30 Seconds to Mars right now and their kind of pop idea. Now, say if they had that same kind of idea, but 16, 17 years ago when they recently when they came out with their first self-titled album, this is what they would have gone off on. So I'm not necessarily a fan of the pop tendencies because they didn't really mix well with the metalcore style. So this one, again, I just thought the mix was off. Going to Find Forever, it had this twanginess from the guitar that I thought like rockabilly 90s in the beginning. But then it went into like this hard rock Jackson 5 remix. And I'm like, huh. The vocals were odd here, especially because they stayed with more of a talk sing style. But you did get some higher pitch vocals in there. And at the end of the like the last part of the chorus, like the whole entire last part, you got this gospel clap in there. So I looked at the mixture. I didn't think it was one of my favorites, but I love the fact they tried experimenting with a Jackson Five sound because when it comes to rock or metal, nobody's really still mixing with that sound or trying to experiment. And Issues tried it, so I got to give them some credit on that one. Going into Tapping Out, it was like a pop production that went into a hard rock song, and I thought. Okay, because it was primarily hard rock. However, the vocals had this very interesting feel to it because it was like hard rock uh, song with hard rock vocals in the style of The weekend. I think The weekend around 2015. So, you know, when Starboy kind of came out, I'm a Starboy. <laughs> I really don't like The weekend. I saw him in concert at the iHeartRadio Music Festival in 2017 in uh, Las Vegas. I was out there with my brother and my aunt and uncle live out there. We all went. My brother uh, wanted to go see Coldplay. Coldplay put on one hell of a show. I wanted to see 30 Seconds to Mars because the first time I was going to see them is the only time I've ever seen them in concert with Tomo. And they cut their shed set short. They had like three songs. I was like, they played Kings and Queens, Walk on Water, and uh, Up in the Air. I'm like, no, wanted more. But oh well, you get what you get. So the chorus, it stuck to this hard rock sound. And the vocal pattern kind of reminded me of something that was a little bit more alt-rock over it. But the bridge in this song for Tapping Out is where it really shines because they went with the unclean vocals. And I like the song because it mixed the vocal styles and that hard rock sound viral. So you mix the unclean vocals in the bridge with the alt-rock vocals style in the chorus and the verse with the kind of like that weekend style. So I really like the mix on this one. This one that mix worked out really well. Let's go into Without You. Kind of had this 80s funk synthesizer, but the one thing I really didn't like about the song was they took influence from Atmosphere. If you don't know Atmosphere, think a hip-hop group from Minneapolis. Go look them up if you don't know what I'm talking about. I do enjoy how the harder guitar, though, in the pre-chorus built it up. I'm like, ooh, okay, this is insane. But the chorus, again, isn't anything to write home about because they really stuck with this Atmosphere vibe, which really didn't work with the underlying instrumentation. I wish it would have stuck with a harder rock sound. It's an interesting blend. The pre-chorus really stands out in this one, though, if you wanted to give it a look. 
So going into rain, they mixed in the right at the beginning, it sounded like a little bit of a funk mix, but then it, as it went on, it's like they mixed the style of Star Set, thinking I See Stars, and May Day Parade, thinking stuff off the album, A Lesson in Romantic, so think Jamie All Over and Jersey, probably two of my favorite uh, May Day Parade songs of all time, and I thought, whoa, this is bringing like a lot of weird emo feels to it, so interesting to see how this goes. And the chorus really takes influence from that those two Mayday Parade songs as well. And the blend really works because you get that emo and the sad boy feel. And it really mixes well with the fact that people don't understand depression when you're going through it. And they just kind of like, oh, you can get over it. So the way Rain was constructed on this one, especially for the title too, this one was constructed almost perfectly. Especially with all those moving parts in it. I really like what they did here. Going into Downfall, the song intro, this hard rock sound, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the verse came I'm like, oh. It's like they went with a soft pop version mixed in with Pierce the Veil. Like, so if Pierce the Veil did went soft pop off of their last album, like they really went soft pop. Yeah, this is kind of where it brought in. I'm like, oh. The guitar, the guitar, guitar, guitar in the chorus goes hard again, but it has that poppier sound. Kind of like a Pierce the Veil went pop again. But it's mixed with this hard rock style. Like, it kind of has a pace, but it has a sound. It's really weird. The vocals in the chorus here hit hard. As the higher pitch on Downfall really hits you on the emotional level that the song calls for. I like the instrumentation on this one as they stick with a more raw sound, but it's still, like, poppy, pierce the veil, weird kind of stuff. It doesn't mix well with the vocals because the vocals are really overproduced. So you're going raw, overproduced. It, sometimes I like that contrast, but the mix here just doesn't really work. Going into second best, the song had a real mellow, depressed emo vibes, like a real mellow, depressed Mayday Parade song, Think Stay. But then it's folks on metalcore instrumentation sound than emo, which I thought, um, what? The verses did change it up to where they use like, really calm vocals, but they keep up with the metalcore instrumentation, which I thought, that's it, different. But, you know, let's give it a shot. I mean, I'm kind of interested. But then the chorus game, I really don't care for them. They're way too monotone. To the point where it's like you're really trying to get something where you're talking about a lack of confidence and oppression cause. And I get it where you're like, oh, you don't really want to do anything. But it's like when the uh, monotone is where it's thinking like, you know, depression caused uh, lack of confidence. I'm thinking real sad, but there's still going to be some emotion in there because you just don't know what to do. So I like the fact they try to mix the sound on this one, but... They hit the mark on the verses really well. The chorus, the monotone, though, they completely lost me. Time to get, get it right. So if you guys don't know, uh, Get It Right is a ninth song. I already sent that. But every when I first saw the song, I thought Get It Right kind of the, um, you guys see, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but South Park, when Eric Cartman, uh, when the boys kind of just stopped acknowledging Cartman, so he thought he was a ghost. And he was going around, like, giving baskets to people with butters to try and get uh, his wings and go up to heaven. And they're singing the song, Kee! Get it right. Something, something, I don't know, but I should have known the words, but get, get it right. Okay, I'm trying to do Carmen, but you guys know I can't do voices very well. So, the intro on this one, I thought, this was interesting. They finally bring in some cool drum fills. Hell yeah! And you guys know me, I really still want to kind of get back into playing the drums. So I'm like, yeah! But then the verses hit, and they go into this Justin Timberlake pop style with a highly produced JT flow. I'm like, no. Drum fills, where'd you go? Because I want to hear those drum fills. They are really cool. And this does not work out for me because the instrumentation does go hard at times. But when it really goes hard, it actually overpowers the vocals to the point where the vocals really get lost within the instrumentation. And that balance is just not there, making this one of my least favorite songs of all time. The only saving grace is the guitar because it does go hard. But this is only when it doesn't overpower the vocals because then it doesn't sound as messy. So this one, the mixture to try and put something in there was there. But man, was it just messy? The best way to put it. Okay, Flexin was the third single, and when I heard it, I thought, what the actual fuck? What is this? This makes no sense. But then, right before uh, the album came out, so two days beforehand, while I was doing the live stream, the uh, person, again, she uh, let us know about the album. She was going to do the podcast. Unfortunately, she was not feeling the best. Um, said that they were going to go with some kind of Prince vibe on this one. So I thought, uh, 
Interesting. And then when we went through the meaning of it, kind of talking about how the band wanted to let loose and try something completely different, do something black sheep on the album, this makes sense? Yeah. You know, you're going to go with something where you're doing a lot of different sounds, but you're still bringing in some kind of rock sound. And now you're going full on Prince on this one. Okay, let's hear what you got. Let's see what you got. It did give me vibes of like, you know, the song Like a G6 mixed with Gorillaz in the beginning and then it transitioned to this whole entire Prince sound. It is clearly the most poppy sound on the record. I mean, there's nothing that can compare to it. It's really heavily produced. Overall, it is the black sheep of the album and the reason I wasn't the biggest fan of it, especially after learning that the fact that they, uh, or actually I should say before the fact that I knew that it was going to be kind of Prince inspired, I just really didn't like the sound of it. After I knew what they were going for, I took it in a different light, and I thought, I'm not a big fan of it, but I'm not a big fan of it because when it comes to trying to cover, like, not to say cover prints, but take influence from prints and make that kind of style into your music and take it as an influence, there is an incredible small room of error or small margin of error because of how intricate Prince was into his music. It's very tiny, and if you just step out of line just a little bit, you're going to get screwed. Here... I thought they came real close, but they were just like just a step outside that margin of error. So there was a little bit of mistakes there, but I do commend them. Not condemn, I commend them for what they did and what and what they tried. Going into no problem, it begins with a funky bass line. I'm like, I'm thinking, is this gonna get into some kind of Motown? But then we are gifted with a mix in the verses of like Lionel Richie. And then a hard rock in the chorus. I'm like, oh, what's going on here? But this is where huge opportunity began to get missed. A huge opportunity because I thought, well, take that Lionel Richie sound in the verses. When you get to the chorus, you're going to go hard rock. Let's just amp it up. Go a little bit more metal. Go a little bit more metal core. And bring the unclean vocals in. Because maybe at this point, that contrast between a softer, poppier sound and unclean vocals could insanely work. And I've seen it work before. I mean, take a look at all those pop goes punk styles. I mean, we've seen it happen. I Prevail, when they did the Blank Space cover, incredibly worked that out well. So I thought they could have done that here. I thought it was a huge, huge, huge missed opportunity. I'm going to go into Beautiful Oblivion next because it is the exact same problem, except you're going with pop tendencies of Justin Timberlake and Bruno Mars. It was the exact same thing where the contrast wasn't there and the chorus was just not necessarily anything to write home ball. The contrast would have been insane for these past two, but it just did not, and I thought they just missed the mark completely. A huge missed opportunity from issues. Last song I'll talk about is 12, which is Your Sake. This one, it begins and sticks with just the regular piano sound, so it's definitely acoustic, and it's all focused on the vocal performance on this one, and it's not like it was kind of interestingly mixed like with a style that Adele would do, you know, like on Hello... It's me, Kevin can't sing for shit because his voice is really poor at it. Hey, I rhymed. <laughs> okay, so I do really have to give some credit to the vocals on this one. They showed a little bit of range, but not too much. But they used a slightly higher pitch to really drive that emotion that the song brings. Again, this is the one I talk about where you have somebody and you're finally breaking free from that relationship and going into the unknown and breaking through that fear and not having to, you know, have that in your head. I thought, again, it was the proper move, and this was actually a really nice song on the album. Overall, I'm going to talk about the album overall. Five out of ten, so I'm split down the middle on this one. So I love the fact, again, they were willing to experiment on this whole entire album. I love that they did that because of the fact that not a lot of bands do that, and if you're going to take a shot at it, I love the fact they went deep dive 100% into it. Um... I already talked about all the meanings of the songs and how they kind of transitioned that way. I really liked how that was put together. If you really look at the voc uh, lyrics, they don't hide a lot from it, and you can really relate to a lot of it. And I talked about songs like Tapping Out Rain and Your Sake. I really do like those songs, but now why I dislike it, I talked about it earlier, the lack of musical identity, because this sounded like it was like a collection of songs, like a movie soundtrack, versus something that would have been a full album, because each song gets its own individual identity by taking so many different influences to where, with issues, I really am not sure what their style actually is. If their style is full on just taking a lot of different influences, then, you know, you did a good job. However, I thought that this was more of like a collection of songs than an actual album. 
There are a lot of missed opportunities as well, and I talked about the contrast between going from a poppy vocal sound to kind of just like a regular clean chorus, where I thought the contrast between poppy vocals in the verses and an unclean chorus would have been insane, but again, I thought they missed the mark on that one. So overall, this is what I wrote for my summary overall. The experimentation worked well with this band. However, the overkill of it makes the album black any kind of identity to where this album is, a, is full of a song or two that you'll like, not one that you'll play on repeat. So you're not going to play the full album on repeat, but everyone's going to like probably one or two different songs on this album because of how many different uh, ways they experiment. So issues, I'm completely split on this one. I'm not saying that you, this album sucks. I am not saying that you did a bad job. I really like the idea that you took on it. I thought that when it came to a lot of the experimenting, at times you missed opportunities. And outside of the consistent meaning and flow of it, the vocals didn't really have that great of a flow. So, or I said the album, the songs didn't have that great of a flow together on the album. So, I'll be curious to see what Issues does going on to this. Would I see him in concert, though? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I just don't know. Probably wouldn't be something to write home about for me at the moment, but you never know. So we also had something, another uh, new song kind of come out. And I was curious because all of a sudden I saw Alter Bridge off their Walk the Sky, which comes out in a little over a week and a half on October 18th. I almost said August 18th. October 18th. They dropped their new single, a fifth single, called Dying Lights. I wasn't as big of a fan of this one as In the Deep. I thought In the Deep is their second best track of all time, only behind Metalingus. But with Dying in Light, Dying Light, I kind of had this interesting mix to it where it sounded like Mark Tremonti kind of had some backing vocals behind Miles Candy, but really didn't. It was a rather long song. It wasn't a bad song, but it's not something that I'm like really got into like In the Deep. Like In the Deep, I really got In the Deep on. This one, uh, Dying Light, just not the biggest thing. However... The biggest reason why I want to talk about this Alter Bridge so song is the fact that it's the fifth single off of uh, Walk the Sky. Now, I'm going to take a look at uh, the complete album here. And there are 14 songs on the album. So there are 14 total songs on this album. One Life, Wouldn't You Rather, In the Deep, Godspeed, Native Son, Take the Crown, Indoctrination, The Bitter End, Pain of Mind, Forever Falling, uh... Clear Horizon, Walking on the Sky, Tear Us Apart, and Dying Light. And we have five of them out right now. The reason I am kind of bringing this up to light is because I think there is another problem that is in the music industry that is finally starting to come down a little bit, but Alter Bridge is falling victim to this, and it's releasing too many singles. So a single, again, it's a one-off song, kind of gets you excited for the album. I don't mind the fact that when the bands release two singles, because I thought, oh, two singles ain't bad. And then you kind of get into three, four. Once you get to five, I'm like, okay. Now you're really starting to kind of spoil the album for us. Like, think about the movies. You get, like, those Marvel movies or the DC movies. I think the DC movies might... And the Star Wars ones. DC and Star Wars are definitely uh, culprits of this. To where you have your teaser trailer, your full-length trailer, your second full-length trailer, your final cut full-length trailer. And you have all these different TV spots to the point where there are people out there on Reddit and uh, other sites. I know Reddit's probably the main one, though. That can piece these things together. And you can find out the whole entire story and you've seen all the good stuff already anyway. So why'd you go see the movie if you already know what's going to happen? So that's when I feel like when it comes to too many singles... But if you're going to release a lot of singles, you're going to end up, you know, ruining the album a little bit because then there's nothing new to expect. So I've got a couple other culprits of this as well, just to kind of bring up examples. One of them is Volbeat. Rewind, Replay, Rebound. Because Pelvis on Fire was a single. Leviathan was a single. Parasite was a single. And Cheapside Sloggers was as well. And so was Last Day Under the Sun. So they had five singles in here as well. I will give Parasite a little bit of a... Uh, pass due to the fact that Parasite initially was just is like a 38 second song. It is not that long at all. So I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? It's not that long at all. So it's really like this one had four singles for 14 songs. But still, or I say four singles for 13 songs because again, Parasite was only 38 seconds. But out of those singles, I kind of remember Last Day Under the Sun. I do remember Pelvis on Fire because it had this Elvis vibe. Cheap Side Sloggers was a song I really wanted to drink to, and Leviathan had a cool Volbeat sound. So I was kind of excited for that, but then again, you're kind of really bringing it down. Uh, let's go to Wage War. Wage War had four, uh, four singles with Who I Am, Prison, Me Against Myself, and Low, I believe. 
and I looked, or Fury, maybe, I don't remember which one, but the, they had the album, I'm like, these singles were fantastic, but they put together the four singles, and they put it out there, and for a 12 song, I've already heard 33% of the album, I don't want to, I, sometimes I don't want to necessarily hear more, but again, I gotta give him credit for Me Against Myself, that's an amazing song, and I could have seen him this weekend, but I got home late, and I couldn't get down to Chicago, my buddy ended up getting a well, drumstick from him, so I'm kind of mad about that, but you know what, what are you gonna do? Um, another band that ended up releasing, I think, too many singles before the album came out was Skillet. Yes, Skillet. They released their initial single, Legendary, back in, like, May or something. I'm like, okay, okay. And then they went with two songs, Save Me and Anchor. Then, right before the album was released, they went with You Ain't Ready. So that's four songs out of the 12. And I'm like, thinking, oh. And I knew one of the, I knew one song that was already going to come was Rise Up because I'd heard it in concert. So I already knew five songs that were on the album, and I had seven more to go. So I'm like, um, okay. But then again, to skills credit, that album was killer. And I just got it on vinyl, so woohoo. Uh, one of the bands that I really want to bring to light on this one was one that did this last year. And. Actually, before I do that, one that's band that's coming out this year so far that with an album that hasn't put out many singles right now, and I hope they don't put out any more, in all honesty, if I can pull up how many they have, come on, is um, St. Asonia. So Adam Gante's new project, or actually his project now, it's not new, he's, but this is going to be the second album for him, so it can't be that new. So they, their flawed design album. It has 11 songs on it, and they released The Hunted as the first single and Beast as the second. I hope they don't release any more singles, and I hope... And again, we got th- like three, three and a half... Or yeah, two and a half weeks? Yeah, we got two and a half weeks until that album... Or three weeks. Shoot, I don't know. I'm going to say two and a half weeks before that album actually drops, so hopefully we don't get too many more. Now, the one I have to kind of bring up as the culprit for this, again, I do understand the fact that bands want to get this their sound out there and make sure everyone knows about it. Let me find the album. It was actually one of my, it's actually my favorite Breaking Measurement album, uh, Ember. So the reason why I bring the Ember up was because with Breaking Benjamin, they always have their first song be the intro and their last song be the outro. That is just their style. So there's 12 songs on Ember. Take out the intro and the outro, and you're left with 10. Now, we had five singles from this album. Five. So I already heard half the album before it even came out. Don't get me wrong. Red Cold River was one of the singles, and that is my favorite uh, Breaking Benjamin song. Psycho was on there too. Not the biggest fan of Feed the Wolf. Save Yourself is fine. But I can't remember. I think Torn and Two might have been the other one. I don't really remember. But I know that, I remember there were five. And I know Break Benjamin does uh, an intro and an outro always. So that left me with five more songs. I heard half the album already. Can we please, please, please maybe put out at the most, at the most, three singles? And here's what I'm saying for. The, at the most, three singles. I think as as LA Dying may have only done three singles, so they kind of went with the way that I would have liked them to go about it. Where? Actually, I think they did four. So I think releasing one single, of course, you're going to want to do that to gain interest for the album. What I think they should do is always release two or three singles. So always have one to announce the album. So always release a single off the album when you announce it. And always release a single, like, the week or two weeks before the album comes out to really gain some attention to it. If you have a long, if you have a long wait, you want to go with one in the middle. Perfect. But otherwise outside of that, don't do that. I mean, I have to give issue some credit on this one as well because they came out with drink about it first. Holy shit. Why do I have so many of these? Um, I got to quickly just get rid of these. It, it, it downloaded twice for me. My God. Let me just get rid of that. Bing, bang, boom. So, with Beautiful Oblivion, they did Drink About It first. Then they did uh, Tapping Out to announce the album back in... So, yeah, Drink About It was the first one, and it was way before the album was announced. This was back in May. Now, album's announced in August, and that's when they come out with Tapping Out. Then a week before the album, they come out with Flexin'. That's three out of 13 songs. So, I still had 10 left that I had to do. And I'm like, okay. I was actually curious for the album through that. Uh, taking a look at Lacuna Coil, they've got three songs out right now off their latest album. They've got Recklessness. If you're in the Bink Bank Boom, it's because I'm noticing a lot of stuff that's on here that I gotta get out. So they got Reckless, Layers of Time, and Save Me. Another Save Me song, dang. 
everyone wants to save me. Oh man, this is going to be fun. I have to go through all this crap. Oh boy. I'm just seeing something like I just notice. I'm like, do I have to go through all of this? Because this might be something that I have to go through a lot of, and I'm not really happy about it. It's done with my computer. But I wish kind of bands would really uh, limit the amount of singles they put out there. Leave it to keep it to two, maybe three, depending upon the album length. That's a good way to think about it. Even of Mice and Men for an 11 track album, they put out four. So um, that's a, in my opinion, that's that is too 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 much. God, and we got this. I got the same thing going too for the last Sleeping with Sirens album. Like I got like two of every single uh, song on my computer right now. I don't want all those files. This always happens with me in iTunes. All the time. We always get in this kind of crap. It's, yeah, I like the fact you're giving me up, but can I just get the album for free that, you know, I like? Yep, and it happened, oh my god, it happened with Tool as well. Oy. Okay, so enough with me bitching and moaning and complaining about all this stuff. I've got another uh, song I need to talk to you guys about. So, do you remember the second band we ever had on the Chord Progression Podcast? Ready by my song of the day, Rock 2000, to today. You guys remember the second one we ever had on here? Oh, God, it happened to Kill Switch 2. God, how far back do I have to go for this? This is nuts. Like, this is absolutely nuts. How many songs did this download? Like, 300? Um, What's the next one I got to pick up? Just to see if it went through. Uh, yeah, da, 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 da. Did Sum 41 come up? Nope. Oh, yeah. Sum 41 I already had to deal with that sh- crap for. What about Crown the Empire? Nope. Okay, I think I'm good. Okay, I think we're good. So, you guys remember Kingdom Collapse, the rock band out of Texas. Well, we had them on the Court Progression podcast back in June. They were our second band ever. These guys are really starting to make some headway, man. Let me tell you. They came out with a new single... The pre- this previous week called Payback. I listened to the song Payback. And what I think of Payback, well, let me tell you a little bit about it. So Payback, again, I got to pull up the video for this on my computer. I'm going to try and keep it so that uh, it is uh, kind of mute. So... The song is all about a story. So in the beginning of the uh, music video for it, it says on August 5th, 2017, due to lack of evidence, six men were released and found not guilty in the murder case of Ron Scott's wife and daughter. On December 2018, Scott took the life or took that life. Scott took the law into his own hands. So it's all about payback for being unjust or getting unjustly treated or unjust, you know, justice, just not justice, anything like that. And you listen to it, and my God, are these guys rocking hard? The music video quality is am- is amazing. They heap this raw sound, but it ke- sounds produced enough to the point where it sounds like they put a lot of time and effort into this one. And you can tell that these guys really, really, really want it. I've seen a lot of the things on social media from these guys. They're playing shows all the time, especially in the state of Texas. Now, when you're dealing with the state of Texas, I mean, you're dealing with the second largest populous state in the country. So just traveling around Texas for them right now is just fine. But I know they want to expand. I know they want to get bigger. I know they want to get better. And I want to see these guys end up having like a headline, like a opening gig for some major tour first. I don't know, some like, alt, not Alter Bridge, because Alter Bridge isn't going to be hard enough for their kind of style. I'm trying to think of a band that could really encapsulate, like Seven Dust could really work with something like that. They could really work with something like Seven Dust or Disturbed even. That could even work out as well. But these guys have a great rock sound, a current rock sound that really needs to be heard. So. I know I featured them once as a song of the day choice. I know I have. And guess what? Payback's going to be another one. When is it going to come? Not sure. Probably when I have kind of done some stuff with the licensing and whatnot and kind of just done some stuff with the reporting and getting it ready. So by the end of October, if you guys have seen stuff that we do for Small Band Saturdays, we put a 30-second clip of the song on our profiles like Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook now. Yeah, starting at the end of October. It's not just Small Band Saturday that's going to be doing it. It's going to be every freaking song we do. 
So you guys get to hear the song, get to hear a preview of it, 30 seconds, and then you get to decide if you really want to listen to the rest of it or not. So you get a taste. You get a more convenient taste of it. And when payback comes, I want you not just to listen to the preview, but listen to the whole thing. You know what? Don't wait till then. Listen to the whole thing right now. Listen to the payback by Kingdom Collapse right now. Or after the podcast, actually, because I got a, two more things to talk about for that I want to talk about. That I want to talk about. Out. Ah! Okay, so, up next, I already mentioned South Park once when I was talking about issues, you know, take, you know, make, make it right. Was it get it right or make it right? Oh my god. Did I really mess that up? There's get it right. Cartman's was make it right. Make, make it right. How embarrassing is that for me? Oh well. So, the new season of South Park started, I believe it was two weeks ago so they've released two episodes so far and we're going on the third one coming up it's always on in uh wednesday i believe however in this previous uh episode the one that came out last week oh my god i didn't get a chance to watch the episode but scouring a lot of different places like um you know kerrang alt press lower fine stuff i saw it that they had South Park on there as like a notice. I'm like, oh, why do you have South Park on here? This is something different. This is something interesting. Let's see what we got. So, it seems like Stan, Butters, Jimmy, and Kenny have formed a death metal band. So, I watched the clip of it, and of course, a little bit of a background on it is joining Stan in the in the Crimson Dawn lineup was Butters on guitar and backing vocals, Stan as the vocalist, Kenny on bass, and Jimmy on drums. The episode's overview took aim at Hollywood screenwriters, catering their content to comply with Chinese censorship as Randy Marsh opts to take his Tegrity Farms marijuana business to international levels, namely China. You know, Tegrity. So, there's a scene, so basically the scene where this kind of starts out with is you, they're at this, like, basically, like, they call it the Autumn Fest, like a harvest festival, and they're on stage, and oh my god. The first song you hear from them is Useless Sacrifice by Francis Death Decline. Oh my god, was that something to listen to? That was something I did not expect, and I listened, like, you look at the shocked look at everybody else in South Park that they made for the characters, and it was insane. Because they literally just took the track and put it on there, and they had Stan doing all the unclean vocals, and the rest of the boys, Butters, Kenny, and Jimmy, just going absolutely bonkers playing this. The one thing I really liked what they did, though, was for this one, was when the clean vocals quickly came in, they didn't use the clean vocals from the track. With Butters as the backing vocals, you get clean vocals from Butters. Now, Butters might be my favorite South Park character of all time. Right around, he's like up there with Randy Marsh and Cartman because Cartman is hilarious and all the stupid crap he does. And Randy Marsh is so ridiculous, it is hilarious. However, Butters has this innocence to him where I just can't get like, I just can't get enough of the stuff that he gets put into and how sometimes when that innocence just gets lost and when he has fun with it. So when, uh, when they did the Butters' very own special episode, that was one of them. Where it was, oh, you know, Butters found out that his dad was um, going to gay bathhouses and cheating on his mom. And his mom freaked out and almost drowned Butters in the car. Or tried to, I should say. There's also the one where the boys are playing with ninja weapons and Butters gets hit in the face with a ninja star. There's also the one where they're uh, playing, uh, what was it? The, they made the cop, they were doing the border patrol stuff. So they were playing, uh, Cartman, they are playing Cowboys versus Mexicans in the... Kids that were playing the Mexicans had to jump over the border, and Butters ended up, like, getting lost and ended up becoming, like, this huge hero in Mexico. And I love that episode because it's Butters. Um, There's the other... There's Butters when he becomes the pimp. That is the best Butters episode of all time. Uh, There's the one where he puts on the 3D goggles and he punches uh, his dad in the balls. That was just absolutely insane. Uh, There's the one they... uh, At the end of last year, they took down Amazon. That, I, it's, it's, I love the stuff with Butters. So when they had Butters doing the clean vocals on this, I just kind of geeked out. I was like, yes! Then they go to a scene where they're in a, uh, the barn at Tegrity Farms and they're practicing. And they're playing the song Second Skin by Dying Fetus. I'm like, no way! And Butters is still doing the clean vocals! 
I love the inclusion of it, and I love the mass contrast between the whole entire premise of what South Park is going for, especially when you're talking about the whole, basically the whole main plot of the season is Randy trying to make his Tegrity Farms go, like, worldwide. And you're dealing with marijuana, and marijuana and heavy metal don't necessarily seem like they go together, but I love the contrast of it. I kind of want to start really keeping up tabs on the new season all because of this i want to see if the boys really continue on with this hot death metal band especially because you got jimmy on drums and kenny on bass and again butters and stan up there with his 100 percent uh hemp shirt from integrity farms i keep i can't help but say it with that twangy accent i can't help it then i just like you know what i gotta start keeping up with south park i think i know they kind of want to get canceled but my god they're just too good all right, uh, last thing on my little list of like, oh, shoot, what I want to talk about. Green Day. Green Day. Yeah, they announced that, you know, super awesome mega tour, super mega awesome tour. However, and they announced a new album as well. But one thing I with Green Day is, especially for when they were younger and they had do- with like Dookie and like that punk rock sound and that raw sound and never wanted to sell it. Then you had American Idiot and all the, com- the comments that like, oh, Green Day sold out, that kind of stuff. So they're coming out with this new album. And for those people that are saying Green Day selling out and it's selling out now, this gives them some more ammo, I believe, that they can take to where Green Day announced a two year partnership with the National Hockey League to like play like use a lot of their music and like do a lot of stuff with them so they premiered a new song at the beginning of the season then they also have this uh coffee thing coming on where they're selling us some a coffee called father of all coffee why did i say it weird it's like it's called father of all coffee and i know a lot of people might be saying a lot of fans might be saying oh no green day is really selling out on this one but honestly are they Reason being is because taking a look at the NHL, the hockey it might be the fourth or fifth most, actually the fifth most popular sport in America. Football is number one. I think basketball actually comes in at number two. I think baseball is three, soccer is four, and hockey is five. And the NHL is cool. Like, I, I, like hockey is awesome. So why wouldn't you want to be in on that? I like the fact they're kind of taking that motive of it and kind of going with it because... You're putting your music out there to hockey fans who, guess what? Hockey fans like rock music. They do. You listen, to, again, you listen to all the stuff that's going on within, you know, the arenas, all the music that they're playing, especially at hockey games or NFL games. They're playing a lot of rock music. You're playing a lot of the, you know, that consistent stuff like We Will Rock You from Queen. We're not going to take it by Twisted Sister. And D. Snyder had a whole rant about this, about the Super Bowl halftime show going to J, J. Lo and Shakira when. Uh, you're playing a music in the same, which is like, we will rock. We're not going to take it. Uh, burn it to the ground by Nickelback. Yeah, they play that. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones they play as well, but it's a lot of, uh, the intro to welcome to the jungle back in black by ACDC. So you're getting a lot of that kind of stuff. And you get it at hockey games as well, because it's a hard hitting sport. And you get contact sport. A lot of rock music really goes well with contact sports. So they're playing a lot of that there, and I get why Green Day's partnership with the NHL makes sense. Plus, when you're really trying to push an album, why not try and push it out any way you can and really kind of have some fun with it as long as the sound is truly yours. The father of all coffee thing, there might be some people that are getting on that, and I have to say, you know what, they're just taking a cool opportunity because there are a lot of Green Day fans. There's a lot of people that drink coffee. There's a lot of people that drink coffee that don't really care that much for Green Day, but maybe they're going to want to like Father of All Coffee, and then they're going to start liking Green Day. Who knows? Coffee has become a huge thing in America. Right? I mean, it's been a huge thing for a while, but there's ever since I got into the workforce, I never realized how big it was until I've been you know, working at Desktop because everyone's like, oh my God, I always need my coffee. Oh my God, I always need this. I always need that. I always need my coffee to get going in the morning. If I don't have my coffee, don't talk to me. Like, I, that's the kind of stuff I hear. Well, not in those voices, but, you know, kind of just, I'm just kind of going off on the cusp right now. But that's what you get. And I never realized how much people like it. And I even Rise Against came out with, uh, like, they had a partnership with a coffee brand called, and they called it, uh, they made up the song Morning in America. It was like Morning in America Coffee. I was like, oh, that's kind of a fun name to have. And taking a look at, you know, the brand of coffee that they went off with and kind of what the proceeds were going to them. Like, okay, that's totally a rise against thing. I don't necessarily remember what it was, but trust me, it was something very rise against. 
Green Day might be doing something similar, and it looks like they are, so I'm not going to bash them for it. I think it's a good move. Again, you're going to get a lot more exposure for your music, even though with Green Day, you're one of the more popular bands that ever have been. Especially, But then again, you're not really popular with the kids with kids today, like, you know, teenagers. It's just rock music isn't popular with teenagers. It, it isn't. It wasn't even that way when I was in high school. So again, think like, shoot, if I think about it, I was a freshman in high school 10 years ago. So yeah, between 7 and 10 years ago. I mean, I still listen to it. I mean, I was always listening to Rise Against and Disturbed. And then as that time went out, I started listening more to some Hollywood Undead, Foo Fighters. Well, I was listening to Foo Fighters. Some Breaking Benjamin entered into the fray. Kind of got back into 3Ds. Guys, kind of that stuff. So that's where we're going with that aspect. However, there are going to be critics to it. I don't mind Green Day taking those moves. It's just, there. I've got a feeling that it might be a slippery slope to where they really go and do something wacky like it. Like, all of a sudden, you see them playing more of a pop-sounding song in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Then I might be like, okay, guys, too much. But if they go at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and all of a sudden I hear American Idiot, I'm going to be like, yeah! Because that would be awesome. Or actually, you know what? I kind of hope a rock band really shows up and really jams out and goes hard at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Not Panic at the Disco because they'll play like High Hopes and that's not something that we're going for. I'm talking like Green Day playing American Idiot. I'm talking like Disturbed going down with the sickness on them. But I don't think that would happen. I think the most likely would be Green Day going in there and playing American Idiot. I would love to see that. Wait a minute. I, I, should, I should post something like about that. Get Green Day. On the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Have them play American Idiot. Whoa. That would be something interesting. That might actually be pretty cool. So I might give that a shot. Who knows? But taking a look at the rest of it, I think that's all I got today. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed me going off the cup, cusp again, kind of with some of that stuff. Kind of with Green Day, kind of with South Park. A little bit with uh, the stuff with all the singles and whatnot. Um, yeah, and check out Kingdom Collapse new song as well. So, guys, I'm going to say this. Uh, I hope everyone's having a good October because it's spooky season. Yeah, spooky season. That, why can't we just call it Hall- like Halloween or something, like Halloween month? I really don't like spooky season because it just sounds like it's something that, you know, again, the internet came up with on social media. I just don't like because I Or maybe I should just stick with it because I can start to keep saying spooky season. Spooky season. Spooky season. Spooky season. Spooky season. I mean, if you go on Instagram, people like Ash Costello are just going heavy into it. I don't blame her. It's her favorite time of the month. Not favorite time of the month. Oh, God, that sounds bad. Scratch it from the record. Favorite time of the year. Because take a look at it. You also get bands like Ice Nine Kills and Motionless in White. So let's give you guys a quick rundown because we are into October. Tonight, I'll be seeing a band that really can embody spooky season. Seeing Guar. So that'll be interesting. Also, we got, uh, for myself, I got In This Moment and Disturbed coming up on the 13th. <gasps> Yay! I can see Disturbed again. Then we go real spooky season full on October 19th because I can see Motionless and White for the second time this year. Then at the end of the month, oh, dear God, you're going to have some fun hearing about this one. Beartooth, I prevail. All, uh, did remember, in Minneapolis, Minnesota! So we're going to have some fun with that one as well. I get to return back to the place i went to college for first time in since 21 months since january 18 yeah because the last time i was there was the like two weeks after the minneapolis miracle yeah man i've been back in that long but then again i'm going back two weeks after that to go to the gopher penn state game and be with my buddies so gonna have some fun with that and looking forward to all those spooky season concerts man i'm really going into that spooky season stuff what am I going to do with myself? What am I going to do with myself, guys? I don't know. But you know what? I got to say this. As always, I want to give everyone a huge, 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 huge thank you for listening to the Core Progression Podcast. Brought to you by my song of day, Rock 2000 to today. It is something that I absolutely enjoy doing. It's something I love. Doing this whole entire music thing. I love talking music with you guys. It's one of my favorite things in the world. And why isn't this working? I don't know why any of this is working. Jeez. Some ain't going right here. I don't know what's going wrong, but let me see. Oh, there we go. There's the music. So I want to thank everybody for coming out and listening to the podcast, but you kind of were just listening by yourself, so you didn't really come out. But again, thanks for listening to the podcast. Tell your friends about it. Anybody that likes rock music, let them know about it. And 
Let us actually, I got a little idea. Let your friends know about the Core Progression podcast. If you if we start gaining some more listeners, and you should tell us that, yeah, I mentioned these people, these people like it. I may bring both of you on the podcast. <gasps> How about that? Yeah. Cause I love talking to you guys. I love talking music with everybody. I love getting in conversations with everybody about it. So again, I want to thank you for that. And that's gonna be it for me today. I'm gonna go see Guar tonight, so. This is Kevin from the Corporation Podcast, brought to you by My Song Day Rock 2002. Today, you guys know how I end all the videos for YouTube, IGTV videos, Instagram videos, everything, and the podcast. See.